Hi, I'm Rajiv, and today I'm going to give you a tour of this, the pottery barn, where I spend every summer making pots, spinning wool, making candles, here in rural Rhode Island. Every morning when I'm here, I make a cup of coffee and walk out here to the sound of birds chirping. And then I unlatch this door and go inside to this magical space. That's the only way to describe it, magic. So this barn was built from local timber about uh, 40 years ago and it's up here on a hill, which sort of creates this beautiful cross breeze. And in the summertime when it's super hot and I'm making pots in here, it's so nice to come up to the barn and actually be cooled off without any air conditioning and without even a fan. Let's go inside. This building reminds me of Pioneer Village. I spent so many summers as a teenager working in this historic site and all the buildings were made out of wood. And there's a wonderful thing about being in a completely wooden building. Uh, the material that was used to build the building completely was once alive. And although it's not alive anymore, wood, wood doesn't just sort of stay the same forever. It changes and it, it changes color over time but with humidity and temperature it, it develops a life of its own way after it's turned into lumber and this building I can I can just feel like it's it's changed so much since it was built and it's changing as I'm using it. When I uh, decided to set this up as a studio and my friend Eve said go for it do whatever you'd like in there. I thought I, I, the main thing I would like to do in here is pottery. And very early on we started calling this the pottery barn <laughs> because uh, it was what it was used for. So I asked uh, my pottery mentor, Guy Wolf, to give me some advice as to how I should set this up. And he said uh, where to, he kind of told me where to put things. Over here we have the main rack that's used for what are called the wear boards, W-A-R-E. And when you're making pottery, these are the, the pieces are called the, the wares. Here are some orchid pots that are drying. Here are some half pots. Um, and everything, everything gets moved around from place to place. And this, this main frame here is really, really useful because when I'm making things, I'm not just making one, I'm making a bunch of them at the same time. And they get made on the pottery wheel, they get put onto these boards, and then the boards get moved around. And depending on what state of dryness it's in, I, I move them around uh, to put them out of the way or to have access to them. So this is mainly what takes up most of the space in this barn. And over there, we have the workstation. So this right here is uh, the main area where I spend my time here. This is the work table. And this is just a piece of plywood covered in cotton canvas. The best thing for kneading clay because it's absorbent 
and um, I can clean this off very easily. So anything that goes on here, mostly clay, at the end of the day, just gets wiped off with a damp sponge, and in the morning when it's dry, it looks so pristine and, and clean and pretty. This wall over here, a very interesting wall. This wall is a replica of the walls in Guy Wolf's studio. So I love being in that studio. I, I just love that space so much. And very often when I'm in there, I'm just looking around thinking, look how nice this looks. And it's just all of his tools. This is the wheel setup, and the wheel setup in the factories, the wheel was set up by a window, and the potter's like right side was at the window so that they they could see the side of the pot, that the side of the, the silhouette of the pot was illuminated. So that's what I did here. Put my pottery wheel right by the window. It's very nice. This is a great wheel. It's Japanese. It's called a shimpo. It's the shimpo whisper. And it's called a whisper because you can, it doesn't make any noise. These enamelware containers, this, this is where like a lot of pottery set up now is plastic, plastic bowls, plastic containers. I don't, I don't like plastic. I don't want to use plastic. It's not, it's just not pretty. So in, in my antiquing and my junk store searches and when Eve goes to a yard sale, she's always on the lookout for these old enamelware containers. And they're great because they can hold water. They also, when they have lids, there's a seal. So I could put clay in there and the clay actually doesn't harden. I constantly reference Black Creek Pioneer Village because it was such a big influence on my life as a teenager and many of the things we did there have carried into my adult life. One of the practices that we had was making very sure that the public didn't see anything modern. Nothing plastic, no devices, no cell phones, everything was hidden. Even electrical outlets were hidden. And sometimes when I was alone in these historic buildings, uh, when there were no visitors and I would just look around, I realized that, wow, everything I'm looking at is historic and it's beautiful. And it's, it's, there's something about, about plastic that is not beautiful. It's just, it's utilitarian and it's functional, but you know, it's, it's, not, it's not pretty. So one of the things I did in this barn was, was set it up so that there really wasn't anything plastic that was visible. There are a couple of things that are part of the pottery wheel, but other than that, any plastic that I have that I'm using, like bottles of things, I hide. This over here is the washing station. And I set this up because at the end of making pots or painting a watercolor, I need to kind of wash up and there's no running water in here. What I do here is what we did in Pioneer Village. We have buckets of water that we fill up in the morning and I just wash in this pail over here with a bar of soap, homemade wise man soap, lovely soap holder, this enamel soap holder and another enamel container for sponges and you know, the washing up it's like when every single tiny little detail is curated and made beautiful, the most mundane thing like washing your hands, I look forward to it. Like it's, it's silly, but every single time I come over here to wash my hands, I think, ooh, I'm, I'm washing. It's one of my favorites. An English lady mass, medieval chant and polyphony. And this is probably my favorite record of all time. I have listened to this probably two million times. The Carter family, their very first uh, recordings. My brave boy, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue in a lonely grave unknown lies a heart that beats so true. 
He sick, faint, and hungry among the vanquished brave, and they laid him shut and lonely within his lameless grave. What's this right here? This is my spinning wheel. Uh, I learned how to spin wool at Pioneer Village. Baskets. This basket is a split oak basket, an, an antique basket that Eve found at a yard sale uh, just a few weeks ago, actually. And baskets are, I mean, baskets for so long were just a utilitarian part of everyday life. Uh, I love using baskets in this barn because they fit in. They're, they're, they hold things, they move things around, but they also look very beautiful. No plastic Rubbermaid totes in here. This basket is for the spinning wheel tools. Carter's the Nitty Naughty. The everyday tools. A broom. One thing that wasn't really in here when I cleaned out the barn was a broom. And I knew that I would be using a broom regularly, so I made the effort to find a beautiful handmade broom. This was made in Vermont, I think. And this, I use it every day. Every time I'm holding it, I think, oh, how nice. How, how nice is this? It's an actual, like, a, a branch from a tree. It hangs up on this post, and look how nice that looks. Just hung up. Everything in this barn is utilitarian. Everything in here is a tool that's going to be used. And when every tool is beautiful, the space becomes beautiful without even, without even trying to beautify it with decorative objects. There's nothing decorative in here. There are a lot of herbs growing on the property. And in the spring, every spring, I go around and cut bunches of lemon balm, mint, sage, and I hang everything up just because it's so abundant here. And it does two things in here. It makes it smell really nice. Supposedly it keeps the insects down in here when, when it smells like this stuff, but it also beautifies the space. I think that drying herbs just add this element of beauty to, uh, to a space like this that's all wood. So there's some lemon balm here. Here's a bunch of sage. I have lavender over there and you know, during the day, I'm not really smelling this stuff, but in the morning when I walk in here, that's the first thing that greets me, the smell of the wood from the building and this stuff drying. The thing that I'm very conscious of about this space is I don't own this space. It's not mine. A very generous friend has allowed me to use this space, and I am a guest here. And while I'm here, sometimes I think, oh, uh, you know, would I like to own a space like this. Like it's not mine, but would I like to own it? And I, I actually stopped the conversation. I stopped myself from even going there because that's not what this is about. My enjoyment in this space is not reliant on whether I own this or not. And I, I think sort of big picture. Do we, do we really own anything? We're here for, if we're lucky, 80, 80 years, 80, 100 years max, and then we're gone. And, and this idea of owning something sometimes takes over. It takes over the simple beauty of enjoying the moment or enjoying the day or enjoying the practice. And this really is something that has become a part of my time in this barn. Enjoy it. Enjoy every little aspect of being in here. It's, it's not about whether this is yours or not. This oil lamp was a recent find, actually, in Toronto, 
And uh, when it's dark in here, I light this lamp and it's just magical, like to have lamp light in here. So there's, there's the table lamp. Th that that uh, fueled this purchase. And this is, this is another very old lamp, but it's a bracket lamp that hangs on the wall. Lamp light was something that I became familiar with yet again at Pioneer Village. We had these evening events like just a few times a year where when it was dark, all the oil lamps in the village were lit. Everything felt very still and quiet. It felt like time was standing still. So when I was working in a studio in Brooklyn on my own making flower pots, I thought, oh, this is gonna be the first time that I'm firing a kiln by myself without Guy Wolf. I was really nervous that stuff might explode or might not go well. And I thought, I think I should make an overcomer of obstacles to put in the kiln. And I used the little bits of red clay that were left over to make this pillar. And he went into the kiln with my first batch of flower pots and everything was okay including him and ever since then whenever I fire the kiln I don't have my own kiln here on the property so the way I fire all this stuff is I trek it all very carefully into town the nearest town and I use a kiln that belongs to Rebecca Cook Rebecca Cook's art studio she's very generously lets me use her kiln Whenever I'm firing there, I take Pilear with me and he goes on top of the closed kiln with a prayer to overcome any obstacles that the firing might have. And when he's not sitting on the kiln, he sits in here, up there. Once I was doing something like on this windowsill, I think I was drying something and it was, it was in the evening and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this something really big just flew across and landed in that cedar tree over there. And I stood very still, but I just moved my eyes and looked over and it was an owl. And it's the only time in my life that I've seen an owl and it was right there. And it, it was the most, it was, it was, it feels like such a gift that I was like five feet away from an owl. And he just turned his head and he looked at me and then he flew, flew away. But that's what happens here. <laughs>